started. So, hi again, thank you so much for joining all of you. And um, we have a lot of people registered for this webinar, which is great to know that there's a lot of interest. Uh, I'll say, yeah, just a big welcome. The title of this is School Food Programming in Ontario in a Time of COVID, How to Make It Work. Um, my name is Carolyn Webb. I coordinate Sustain Ontario's Edible Education Network, and I'll be moderating the meeting today. So I'll just say again, a big thank you to all of you who are joining us. We were just talking about how it's conference season and how much is happening right now and how full life seems. And so it's great that you've made it today. Uh, Sustain Ontario's Edible Education Network has been established to support individuals and organizations who are working to get children and youth eating, growing, cooking, celebrating, and learning about healthy, local, and sustainably produced food. And I know a whole lot of you have been involved in the, the network um, throughout it's time. So uh, we've hosted this webinar to open up a space to share ideas about how to continue to offer school food programming in a time of COVID. And I should make a specific note that the focus of today's call is on food literacy education rather than food service or delivery. There's all different aspects of school food and we've decided to focus today's on food literacy. If you would like to talk about school meals and snacks on a future call, um, we'll be sending out a survey after this and you can specifically note that and we can you know, arrange some future conversations on those themes. Um, so we're going to hear specifically today from organizations who are trying to figure out how to continue to engage students in hands-on food literacy in this very different time period. And uh, with schools looking so different this year, the idea for this webinar of that how to make it work, well, we know that that's a huge question and we won't be able to answer it fully in the hour and a half that we have, but we can at least share ideas and know that we can continue our conversations and going forward. I'll just uh, change my slide. Our agenda today is um, we will be starting well with my welcome and then we'll have our presenters speak. We'll follow that with a short Q&A time period um, and um, then go to breakout groups where people can share their stories and um, just have ideas that they have on how to make it work and a short report back. We know our time is really tight. Um, and so uh, we won't be able to touch on anything as much as we'd like, but we'll be able to, to, I think, still do a lot in the time that we have. I should note that the presentations and the Q&A time will be recorded and shared publicly afterwards. And I'll work on just recording the speakers and their presentations, but it is a bit of a test for me. So if you would like to not have your video recorded at all, I'd suggest you um, turn it off. In the breakout groups, nothing will be recorded. And so you can just speak freely. Um, I will ask people to, while our presenters are going on in just a minute, I will ask everybody to write your questions in the chat box during the presentations. And then after the presentations are done, I can sum up and bring forward just some of the main themes that emerged. I'll ask each of the presenters to speak to those main themes, and then we'll go on to the breakout groups. And if your um, question wasn't addressed during the um, the Q&A, we can try to respond by email or you can bring it up in the breakout group again. So I think the last thing I wanna say is just a thank you to Farm to Cafeteria Canada, whose partnership and support have made this, helped to make this meeting possible. And with that, I will pass this over to our first presenter, Sunday Harrison from Green Thumbs Growing Kids. Over to you, Sunday. You should be able to just load your presentation over mine. Uh, thank you so much, Carolyn. Uh, right, I gotta share my screen first. I think, yeah, do you wanna continue? Yes, share. Super. Looks good. Um, um, is it, yeah, okay, there we go. So yeah, so I'm Sunday Harrison from Green Thumbs Growing Kids and our organization is really focused on the land around schools in downtown Toronto. And so we're, we're garden based. We do a, a pre-COVID classroom food literacy uh, programming as well. But I, I have to say that our connection to the lunchroom programs, the breakfast and lunch programs is good in only one of four schools where we operate. Um, so that's kind of a disconnect that I'll highlight right away. Uh, we started in 99 as an after school program, connecting kids to nature and food production, and then moved on to school grounds. And we partner with three to four schools a year uh, fairly deeply and another 10 maybe depending on the year uh, with a lighter touch. 
Um, we are a charity and we don't receive any funding from our school board. Um, I'm the founder and I continue to work as executive director and I um, completed a master's in environmental studies and focused on school gardens in Ontario to, to deepen my own knowledge. So there's a link to that here. These are my beautiful colleagues. Ohama Boateng is our garden and food educator. Mika Miller is our indigenous programs coordinator. And Anusha Santhakumar is our youth and volunteer programs coordinator. So from May onwards, we were granted access to our partner school gardens for the sole purpose of growing food being recognized as essential workers during the pandemic and supported by the sustainability office at Toronto District School Board, we were actually able to open our gardens before the province declared community gardens essential, uh, allowing cultivation under COVID protocols. We observed those protocols and had no volunteers or program participants. The food we grew was harvested weekly and donated to Region Park Mothers for Peace who divided the produce into bags for local families and an Aboriginal HIV AIDS uh, service organization that used the produce in their street outreach programs. Um, in June, we hired six summer staff through the Canada Summer Jobs Program to cultivate the gardens and manage the produce deliveries. They also cultivated this green roof, which is at our office building in Region Park, the Daniel Spectrum Building. and they are bringing it into production. Um, once farmers markets were allowed to open, we brought produce there. Um, the advocacy to get those markets to open, some of you may have been aware of, it was very similar to that which allowed the community gardens to open. Um, we concentrated on visibility for our programs in the markets and value added produce and also edible weeds for our market stall. OHEMA has been crafting and delivering online programming in partnership with teachers and their students. Supporting her are, it's a little video. Supporting, supporting her are post-secondary students on placements. We have seven nursing students, four teacher candidates and two sociology students. Ohema runs a virtual classroom program, Growing Microgreens. She has a few programs, but this one is the most popular. We supply a pea shoot growing kit for each student, and then Ohema hops onto a call and walks everybody through planting. The program incorporates social emotional expression as well as science and nutrition. Um, part two will be a nutrition workshop delivered by our nursing students that follows once the pea shoots have grown. Um, we're also running an after school online program for refugee kids in partnership with a number of other organizations that includes a mindfulness component. Another way we're engaging with teachers and their students is through a mapping tool and specifically garlic planting this fall. So each garden has been mapped. We used, a, we used an app called Garden Planner that's available through uh, Mother Earth News. Um, it, it's, it's a live mapping tool. So it's, it doesn't work so well for multiple users because it, it, but anyway, it just helps you, you know, map your garden and put, you can drop these little icons um, in of the plants. So that's fun. So we use that and we supplied the garlic to three schools. And Ohema um, created a little video, a garlic planting video that the teacher can play. Um, and so through our programming, we're trying to convey the importance and relative safety of going outside on the school grounds whenever the weather permits. And we've signed an open letter to our school board asking for infrastructure and enabling policy on outdoor education. Um, a teacher used the garlic planting to introduce procedural writing with her class. And this deepens the learning because you have to revisit each step in order. 
which increases retention. The last line is great. Congratulations, you have successfully planted garlic. Now, all you need to do is wait eight months and then you will have grown garlic. Um, outside of our food programs, we also have an urban trees from seed program where we are growing out native tree species from seed to support biodiversity in the tree canopy. Kits are distributed to each student. You can see them on the left and um, the tree seedlings are then planted in school nurseries and ultimately planted out into the community. We are using the Kentucky coffee tree known by its Anishinaabemowin name of Bijuatig which grows readily from seed. It's actually an edible species, but it takes some specialized equipment to process. And much of our transport is by bicycle and bike trailer. And that's all I got to say for now. Um, there's our contact and social media and um, excited to hear what other people are doing. Thanks so much, Sunday. It's really inspiring seeing all the different ways you're, uh, you're adapting your program. All right, next I will ask Andrew to speak. And Andrew, is it um, your Growing Chefs account that I should be putting the video on? Yes. Yes, please. Yes. Is all right. Thank you. Can you hear me so all right, Carol? Feel free Carol? to share your... Yep, I can see you fine. Perfect. Um, so... Uh, one of the fun things today is that we won't need to be sharing our screen. We're going to be doing everything from this video shot here. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Andrew Fleet. I'm the co-founder and executive director for Growing Chefs Ontario. Uh, we're a charity in London, Ontario that offers uh, food literacy and food education programs uh, with community agencies and schools all across London and Middlesex. Uh, uh, generally, when we're not in pandemic times, our programming will reach approximately 10,000 children per year uh, through all of our program streams. Obviously, in the spring, uh, like everyone else, we had to shut down and quickly made the decision to uh, start adapting our programming to offer online. At first, we weren't sure if this was something we were going to really run with. Um, and we were just trying to get some content online to uh, help to fulfill some of the programming that we had scheduled kind of in late March and April that we were hoping to still um, offer something. Uh, we had our staff uh, shooting videos on their uh, you know, iPhones, not really editing the final product and putting it up on uh, Facebook in a private group for free viewing. Um, we were thrilled when over the first 30 days, our group grew from about uh, two dozen people to about 500 people. And in the second month, as we continued to put content up there, it quickly grew to over 1500 people. And now we're approaching uh, 2000 members in that group. And routinely when we put new videos up, we'll have about 500 people following uh, along with those videos just in the first 24 hours that they're uploaded. Um, with that uh, shift, we decided to put a little bit more effort as we brought our staff back from the, uh, from the shutdown into continuing with this virtual programming. And we're incredibly lucky at the time. Uh, this was through April and May uh, when uh, things were just starting back up again. We received some funding that we had applied for to build a second programming facility. Some of our programs had uh, grown the wait list to uh, get into those programs for some schools had reached up to five years again, uh, and we were just operating generally uh, way over capacity. Mm -hmm. So we were super lucky to receive some funding. And one of the things that we uh, asked for in that funding for our new programming facility was a video set up so that we could do a live video broadcasting. So as opposed to, we, we were offering these programs at times we would have parents and children cooking together and could have up to 150 people following along in, in these massive of cooking sessions, which seems a little silly now in the middle of a pandemic, but that's what we were doing. And we wanted this video system so that we could offer instruction up on screens for people to see, to help cut down on some of the uh, uh, endless paper that we were printing with equipment lists, ingredient lists, instructions, and recipes. So this is our new video setup that I wanted to show you. Uh, first of all, before we go into it, uh, just want to be clear, 
something like this is absolutely not necessary to offer virtual programming. We were it's the strength of your programming and instruction that's going to give uh, people the value, but it also doesn't hurt. Um, and it's pretty neat to, sh I'm excited to show you what the setup can do. So first of all, uh, the setup offers the ability to switch seamlessly to uh, different camera angles. So we have an overhead camera angle, so our chefs can offer detailed instruction. Tonight, we have a live Zoom program happening with an after school program. Uh, Mesa, I'm going to get you to go back to the overhead shot again. <clears throat> Um, this is an ingredient box that uh, children in our program tonight are receiving. And uh, as you unpack the ingredients, um, this overhead shot not only really helps with the detailed instruction um, that we're offering, but it even helps parents to follow along uh, and figure out what, exactly what it is they're supposed to be looking for. One of the things, you can go back to the straight view, Mason. One of the things we discovered very early um, in our programming was with pre-recorded content, it was important for parents to be able to pause the video at any points to be able to keep up with the instruction. But when we shifted to more of a live Zoom or, or Teams or just like an online live programming format, uh, people, we were getting the feedback that the instruction was very, very quick and we had to slow down. What we found was having the multiple angles and being able to really offer that close up view of what the chefs were doing uh, helped people to be able to keep up and we didn't have to slow things down quite so much. So the other thing that we can do with this live setup is we can um, offer graphics and live text and slides right in the live broadcast without having to share your screen. Um, so as you can see, this is kind of what it looks like. And we use this for providing all of the information that people need to follow along with. And you can go to the next slide, Mason. I just want to give a shout out to uh, Mason is, is uh, transitioning between all of our camera angles. One of the drawbacks to the system is it's not easy to operate. It obviously is a lot more expensive and requires a pretty specific skill set. So big shout out to Mason for uh, coming along and on this journey with me today. Uh, there isn't a day that we don't learn something else about the system. But again, especially when you're producing uh, pre-recorded content, it does provide uh, quite a value add in the end production look of your videos. And so what we've been able to do while creating video resources is we've developed a whole resource section for uh, parents and teachers and families, including uh, video topics like uh, getting started, how to organize your kitchen for cooking activities for kids, uh, safety videos in terms of working with sharp things like knives, safe choppers, paring knives, peelers, and graters, uh, different strategies that we've developed over the past 12 years for introducing uh, foods to young children and dealing with picky eaters. Uh, as well as how to shift and organize recipes and cooking activities for children of different ages or multiple children at a time. Um, and on top of that, we've produced dozens of instructional recipe videos to date with dozens more planned in the coming months. Uh, we've also started developing live programming partnerships with many community partners here. One of the exciting things about this is because of the virtual format, we're not limited like we were before in terms of capacity. So we can have a larger number of kids cooking along with us at home and we can partner with agencies outside our immediate area that we would struggle to get to and, and work with before, which is really positive. Um, I've mentioned before the, the multiple camera angles has really added uh, to the ability for people to follow along and help to make sure that their end product without our one-on-one -on -one guidance is turning out uh, as good as it can. Um, and uh, obviously a little bit of a improved picture and audio quality as well. Mason, you can go to the next slide there. Thank you. Uh, as well, we're developing a series of lesson plans for teachers in schools, starting from JK all the way up to grade 12. Next week, we have over 65 teachers uh, uh, going through a pilot project to test out these recipes and give us some feedback. And then early 2021, we'll be uh, launching a full brand new website with all of these lesson plans freely accessible to teachers and parents and homeschoolers and virtual learning coordinators across the province. Some of our lesson plans that we're piloting right now are based on food systems. Again, introducing new foods to picky eaters or, or learning to taste like a chef, uh, edible art, composting and reducing food waste, uh, growing gardens in your classroom, uh, applying math and science to the kitchen and the history of food preservations as well. 
Um, we'll also be launching a, a build a restaurant project with them, which I'm really excited about, which is going to incorporate almost 20 lesson plans in a really massive project that you can adapt for different ages uh, and grade levels and pull from. Um, it's going to be quite exciting. We can't wait to share it all with you. Uh, finally, one of the things I wanted to say is uh, this new setup allows us opportunities to partner with different groups outside of our areas we've mentioned before. Um, some ideas that we've had in ways that hopefully Growing Chefs can help uh, any agencies that are looking for support in adapting their programming to a virtual environment is, of course, we can customize live programming uh, for and with you and your clients. Uh, we can build train the trainer programs for your staff in terms of adapting live programming to the virtual environment as we've been doing that for the past eight months. Uh, we've developed some systems that may be very helpful to share for staff. Uh, we can also, of course, share all of the live video content is going to be freely accessible on YouTube and, and are hoping that people will find it helpful and fun to follow along with. Uh, but most importantly, I am expecting that there are going to be people uh, watching this and partners from across the province that are going to have ideas that we haven't thought of yet. And we really do want to hear from all of you. So if you have any ideas and ways that we can help support you, uh, because we've been lucky enough to, to get this cool, fancy setup, um, please reach out to us and let us know. And in conclusion, just want to say thank you so much for being included in this webinar, for following along. Um, I will provide all of these to Carolyn to share with all of you, but please do keep an eye on our new website launch coming late December uh, 2020, if all goes well, and especially our YouTube channel and social media channels, which will have all of that free content posted as well. Thank you so much, everyone. Super. Thanks so much, Andrew, and for sharing your cool, fancy new setup. It's pretty awesome to be live. Um, I will say I've just been so excited at the opportunities for partnership that you've put forward. And uh, it'll be really great to see just how many people, you know, approach you for opportunities and how to, yeah, how we can all think creatively in this time, eh? Um, all right. I am going to now ask uh, Layla um, with Kids Growing City to speak. And Layla, I'm going to spotlight you. Just a sec. There you go. Hi, hello everybody. Uh, my camera seems fuzzy a little bit, but that's okay because I'm going to be sharing the screen most of the time and you don't need to really be looking at me. So let's do that. Okay, can you see the screen well? Yep, you're good. Awesome, great. Okay, so. Okay, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for being here, and thank you for your attention. So, uh, we are going to talk about Kids Growing City, uh, how it started uh, pre COVID, during COVID, and uh, some plans that we have for post COVID times. Uh, and my, my name is Leila Bilet Skandari. I'm the founder and director of Kids Growing City. Uh, I'm a former software developer with a bachelor's degree in applied mathematics. I'm a certified permacultural designer. I have a master's degree in environmental studies, focusing on researching the obstacles and solutions to uh, school gardens. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks to uh, Carolyn and Sustain Ontario for putting this together. Uh, as I mentioned quickly, I'm going to go through our mission and vision and what we've been up to up until now, what we did to adjust during COVID and what's the plans for afterwards. So Kids Growing Cities' um, mission is to fill the educational gap and empower future generation with the skill of growing food. Um, we envision a successful school garden in every school and a successful kids garden at every home. And we do this by connecting children to the natural origin of their food by providing opportunities for authentic hands-on and comprehensive experiences with growing their own food with their own hands. Now, um, Kids Growing City started in 2014 with the very humble beginnings of an after school program in one private school. And it grew into this uh, comprehensive in school curriculum connected program that we ran uh, in 2019 in 14 public schools in TDSB and YRDSB and a few private schools as well. So uh, we facilitate a 10 week comprehensive student centric uh, school garden program one in spring and another 10 week one in fall, which completes the whole year uh, cycle of the garden from seed to seed. 
and from building the garden to closing it for winter time. And it's all done by the students, even the building of the gardens. We also have teacher training. So training the trainer is has always been one of our focuses. Uh, and we have in-school training for participating schools. We have in-person workshops and conferences from time to time. And we have online courses and clubs, and we've had them since 2014. And we're also helping parents at home to grow home gardens with their kids. And we've been doing that since 2014 as well. Uh, this is, as I said, the humble beginnings that we had in this private school as an after-school program in 2014. And uh, Skipping two years, uh, we started uh, in-school programming in public schools. And these are some of the examples of the pr produce uh, that these gardens uh, produce, as well as the, the way they look. Um, again, this is some of the pictures that you can see in 2018 and some of the produce uh, that was uh, produced. Um, in 2019, we started hiring facilitators uh, up until this point, uh, I was doing the teaching myself, uh, but again, the, the demand was higher than I could handle by myself, so uh, hiring some facilitators really helped out, and that's how we could grow our program into 14 different schools. Uh, and this is some of the results that these amazing facilitators helped the schools to grow, and I have to thank the teachers because the involvement of the teachers in the, uh, and uh, the support of the principals and the school boards obviously is what makes uh, all of this possible and as you can see not only there's lots of food growing in these gardens but there's also lots of seeds which is an important part of our program seed saving uh, as you can see the, these gardens not only produce uh, seeds and food but our programming uh, also involves uh, tasting uh, the produce uh, sometimes we make smoothies and things like that uh, it, this is just a one-time thing at the end when we harvest, um, and, and there's a lot of literacy in terms of biodiversity and anything else that connects to food that happens during our programming. And this picture right here is uh, uh, our contribution, uh, the garden's contribution to the snack program that this school already had. So the success of Kids Growing City was actually based on two main things, the experience, obviously, but also research. Uh, so as I quickly mentioned, my research uh, in the master's degree, my master's degree research was about the obstacles and the solutions of school gardening. And uh, two uh, pillars of our programming that uh, helps us to succeed well is that we build these gardens based on permaculture principles so they're very easy to build very easy to maintain and support during summertime they're biodiverse and they connect to indigenous studies because of the way uh, that we take care of the land while we build these gardens and uh, the second pillar is about uh, how student-centric our gardens are because absolutely no physical work is done by adults not even building the garden Everything's done by the students, um, and that what that's what makes the, these gardens uh, really beautiful. And um, and that's about the in school programming, on the grounds programming. But we've also been very active online with programs, and workshops, and classes and clubs that we had for teachers, as well as for parents at home. And uh, so I'm going to focus a little bit uh, later on the Oasis box, and that's a subscription box membership that we have for parents, uh, which, uh, which is delivered to their home every uh, month. Um, and when COVID came, essentially what happened was uh, all our in-school programs obviously was, was shut down, just like everybody else. And our online programs for teachers were also shut down. Well, they weren't shut down, but they were not that uh, successful, obviously, because when there's no teachers in any schools, because the schools are shut down, there's no programming happening, uh, so the teachers would need to be trained. Um, and that was actually devastating for Kids Growing City because, well, just like every other business that was shut down, nothing really special about us. But we're a very small organization, and uh, so we put our focuses on two things. One of the things that we focused on was the Oasis box for parents. So we put some money into that to grow it, even though uh, it was really hard. Uh, 
in terms of uh, monetary resources uh, at that time, because uh, Kisproin City's uh, main uh, programs were the, are in school programs and the main uh, income that was coming in was through that and that was completely shut down. Um, so when we did that, there were some parents uh, who were teachers and they approached us because this uh, box actually has an online portion, we call it an online resource library, all of the educational material that are, are printed and included in these boxes are also available online to those parents who are in, who are uh, participating. And um, these teachers who were teaching online uh, were approaching us to ask if they can use this material to provide to the families that they were teaching so that they can also uh, participate. And obviously the answer was yes. Uh, and this actually opened up a door for uh, a different type of programming that could help teachers who are teaching online. Now, another thing that we're very actually excited about that we did during uh, uh, COVID was that even though the funds were really low, but out of pocket, we put some money into um, uh, collaborating with uh, very experienced teachers who were also excited and interested about what we're doing. And we created a hybrid program that we're very excited to introduce this spring. Hopefully, schools will be open, <laughs> at least the way they're open right now. Um, and at that point in time, this would be very beneficial because our lesson plans that our facilitators uh, used to run in schools were very uh, interactive. They, they had a hands-on component, but they also had an uh, interactive lesson. So, for example, we talk about seeds, and then there's the hands-on component that comes uh, that connects uh, to the topic of seeds and building the garden and all of that. So there's a lesson and the lesson can be synchronously taught through Zoom or Google Classroom, uh, which we have a lot of experience with anyway. And the hands-on part could be done by training the trainer. So the teachers would be able to go ahead and do the, that work, which creates some flexibility because when we go and uh, into a school and we have to do everything in one hour, uh, the time can get tight. But if the teacher can do that half an hour of hands-on programming during the week until the next session comes up, then that would be that would create some flexibility, and a lot of teachers would appreciate that. So we're putting together a package of uh, so the schools would, would uh, receive this package that's delivered to them. Um, it's our ten lesson plans, and they will have access to it online as well. A complete map for all curriculum connections to all of the lesson plans that we're providing, as well as ten posters. And we're we're investing a little bit into creating posters as well because we think they're very interesting uh, and powerful tool. And uh, also, they will have access to an online class and an online course. So it will include ten recorded lessons for the teachers as well as 10 synchronous lessons for students taught by our facilitators. Um, and plans for post-COVID, uh, frankly, who knows what's going to happen. But um, if there's one thing that COVID taught us is uh, that the power of technology. And there's, if there's one thing that technology is very powerful at, it's that if it's used appropriately, it can expand our reach, as Andrew was also mentioning. Uh, to touch more lives without having to be physically uh, traveling uh, to those places. So our plans are to continue with the Oasis box for families um, and uh, tweak the Oasis box online so that it's better suited for teachers. The ones that don't want necessarily to build huge school gardens, but would like to introduce very small um, like projects that can be done uh, at home because that's exactly what these Oasis boxes are. Uh, and uh, our in-school hybrid program can also expand into post-COVID times, obviously, because as I was mentioning, it actually uh, gives us uh, the ability to uh, collaborate with a lot more uh, students. Uh, so if we go to a school and we can during one day and during these 10 weeks, we have to be physically there. We can only touch the lives of, let's say, 100 students. But if you're online, we can do this with many, many different schools. And we can hopefully touch the lives of thousands and thousands of students. 
Um, that's that's about it for my presentation. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing. Did I stop sharing? Yeah. Thanks so much, Lila. It was really great to hear about all the things that you've been thinking through and just ways to adapt your programming in this uh, this very different time. So I really appreciate it. It is. It is. Thank yeah. you. Uh, all right, I'm going to now ask uh, Ed Krevitz, our last speaker, to um, speak from Parkdale Food Center. All righty. Oh, did I turn my video off? Your video is off, yeah. How did I do that? It's possible. The host has stopped your video. video. Yeah, it says you stopped my video. Start video. Here we go. I will. <laughs> Uh, here. There we go. Yep. Sorry. Right. Great. That's okay. <laughs> I just like to make sure you can see my face. I know it's sometimes hard on these calls to uh, stay focused. So oh, I'm just no, going gonna... to add a reminder to everybody. It would be great if um, people, if you have any questions, to just put them in the chat box while uh, Ella is speaking, and then we can speak to them during the Q&A time. All right. Thanks. How would you know? Okay, so um, yeah, so welcome everyone. Um, it's great to, it's hard to follow up from all these interesting presentations that we're hearing this morning, um, but I'm going to do my best to just share what we've done and really focusing on since September. So I know that that first bit of school programming was really challenging for everyone, um, but today I'm going to focus on what we've done since September in this school year and really focusing on sharing food when we're being told not to share food. I, I know I'm stealing that from Andrew. We talked about that on Friday, but it really does hit home and uh, I'm based out of the Parkdale Food Center, which is an emergency food uh, service program in Ottawa, and we do a lot of educational and employment programs in addition to that. So um, what we used to do, or what we, what we started with was that we had an internal reckoning about why schools. Um, it would have been very easy for us to work with homeschool groups or pods. Um, but I really appreciate that the organization challenged us to invest in public systems during this time, that COVID has really pointed out the difference between the haves and the have nots. And um, although it was a lot more challenging to work with schools, and it, it is a lot more challenging to work with schools, um, it is just so important to invest in those community resources because they're a great equalizer. And what we're finding is that teachers are like desperate for content. They spend the whole time at the front of the room just teaching and it's exhausting for them. And their students need stimulation and kinetic learning opportunities as much as possible. So before COVID, we were running something called our Solutionary Workshop Program, um, which was a kind of a social justice and food justice program with some food literacy skills combined in it. And it was basically three one hour workshops where people could come to us or we would go to them. We would have these amazing discussions with kids about what, what food access issues were happening in our neighborhood, what was going on, what did we notice about our neighborhoods. And we were really trying to teach kids to become solutionary, people who see opportunities where others see problems. And so the pandemic hits and then we're like, oh, wow. Now we really gotta, we gotta meet this mark that we set for kids and that we see kids rising to all the time because we see their creative brains tackling big problems. So we had to do that too within ourselves. So what we've done, um, and I know it's a little bit busy, but this is just a poster that we share with our, with our teachers that we've worked with in the past to tell them about this new program. So our current offering is to do two one hour sessions on back to back days. And the first day is really all about food justice and accessing good food and the challenges that come up in that and learning about our local community food system. And this day is all done with 100% pre-recorded videos where teachers start and stop and then they answer questions on a, they have a handout for the students. So it helps gain better, or finding online is actually better for finding individual student reflection as opposed to when they came to the center, we were having great class discussions, but some students might be left behind because they need just a little bit more time to kind of think through what they're learning. Um, so we're finding that works really well and it's completely hands off for us. So we send the content to the teacher and then they run that programming for day one. And then day two, we want to make it, we want to keep it light and fun and hopeful this year, especially I think we all need a little more hope. Um, but day two, so we focus on, on community food problems in day one and day two is all about hope. And so we learn from local community food leaders like farmers and chefs um, about what they're doing and, and how they envision the food system changing and what their role is in it and helping kids see themselves as having a role in building a better food system. Um, and then we do, uh, we provide meal kits. Um, so each student has everything they need in their kit so that they can do it at their desk. Um, and they make a little prepared 
snack. We'll say <laughs> it's not a meal, it's a snack. Um, and then we follow, we finalize the kind of the two day program with a live check in and Q and A. So um, this is kind of what day one content looks like. So we get this. This is the first side of a two page handout with some questions for for youth to follow. And then I want to give you a little snippet of what our pre recorded videos look like, just to show you how that. I know Andrew kind of mentioned that with pre recorded videos, they go so much faster than live. And so it's hard for people to keep up. So we've actually built that start and stop pause into our content. And um, I just want to give you a little taste of what this looks like, because it is so uh, exciting. Let me just, I have a little section here I want to show you. A little bit better. As a first step, we need to understand why people are hungry. And there are many barriers to accessing food. Hey, Karen, what's a barrier? A barrier is something that stops you from participating in something. For example, a fence could be a physical barrier, or like all this office equipment that's in the way. Not all barriers are visible. Some of them are invisible. As Karen mentioned, some barriers can be physical. For example, when accessing food, a physical barrier might be transportation and how you get to the grocery store and how you access food through transportation. So if you don't have a car or have a physical disability, like you use a wheelchair, you're differently able, you might have a barrier of accessing food. Whether that's going to a grocery store or cooking at home, we want you to think about what challenges can prevent somebody from being able to have good food. Okay, so here's how this works. Everybody should have a sheet that looks like this one. As the video goes along, we're going to go through each question and get you to pause the video, fill out the question, unpause the video, and then see if we got the same kind of answers. Don't worry, you will know when to pause it because there will be some drama. Okay, let's do it. Question numéro un. There are no wrong answers. Write down as many ideas as you can think of in two minutes. Pause this video and come back in two minutes when you have your answers. So that just gives you a little taste of kind of what we've done and, and a little bit more than just the certain stopness of it. But what we really wanted to emphasize too is that this content is not the same as engaging people in person. It's hard to engage students online and making it fun and silly has been something that we really have had to embrace. And we've, we've done some videos with some scenes where we're like, oh my gosh, is this really going on YouTube? Um, but the feedback we're hearing from students about how engaging it is makes it totally worth it. So um, just to say that we are getting really deep into some serious content, um, but at the same time, we're keeping it light and keeping it accessible and keeping it fun for students. And that's um, just creating a really positive experience. Whoop. Okay, here we go. Um, so uh, day two, uh, every student gets their meal kit. And this is what our, our meal kit looks like. Um, it's just a simple, simple but super kale salad. Um, and so the day starts with a video from a local food leader. Um, it was actually a farmer from a Just Food Farm this month. And um, yeah, and then they have all these things and they go through a pre-recorded video again that starts and stops to show them how to prepare it. And then we do a final live check-in to round out the two days. Um, and we're getting a lot of really good feedback from this. Um, but I wanted to just share some lessons for us in when we were deciding to design this program. Uh, we went with pre-recorded videos because they're less dependent on our time in the long run. They do take a ton of time to create though, like a ton of time. Um, and we can reach a virtual audience that's much bigger with the day one content, although we're focusing on doing this full two day content with local schools that we've already worked with. And um, the live portion actually allows for increased evaluation because we have more scripted questions. We're less trying to teach in that live component and more trying to facilitate discussion. So we are asking, um, you know, how many of you have tried something new, a new ingredient or um, a new a new food item and 90% of students are saying yes, like that this is something and this is new for them. Um, and we're seeing really just really rich evaluation coming out of that kind of intentional uh, time together that's live. Um, and we're also using the handouts to kind of track individual youth learning with some of those questions. So the teachers mail those handouts back to us. And uh, the hands-on kits are so great. They're, they're fun for students and they're easy for teachers. Um, but all of this is made with just, you know, our, our, our cell phones and uh, a rickety old tripod. And we did invest in some uh, video editing software, but uh, really what we had to invest in was the learning curve of learning how to do these videos. And I really have to thank my colleague, Karen Freeman. She's a real talent. She's really developed this skill set in the last year. So uh, shout out to her. 
And uh, our future plan is to create a series of these offerings following the same model um, so that we can engage in new topics um, and we have different meals. So we're introducing new food skills along the way, but that's sort of the, the model we're working towards. And then financially, um, we are asking for schools to contribute uh, to, for paying for the kids, which never is gonna be enough to quite cover the cost of the whole program. Um, but we are looking to get a bit of a sponsorship model going with some of our, our local businesses that uh, you know, wanna support food literacy initiatives. And we're, we haven't secured that, but that's sort of our hope for how this will be sustained into the future. And then I just wanna to touch on challenges that we faced, which is that there's no sharing of materials in classes right now. So no collective pot, like we used to love doing crock pot stuff. We can't do that anymore. Um, and uh, materials distributed to students need to be delivered to the school 72 hours in advance, which is when you're talking with like fresh food and grated apples are in those kits, uh, it's a little bit challenging for sure. So we've had to work out a few kinks there. Um, and of course, teachers are extremely um, tapped out. So that's all I really wanted to share with you today, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Thanks so much, Al. Before we go into questions from everybody, um, someone asked, did you do the editing yourself or did you hire a company? No, we, so our, our team is just me and one other person and uh, I, I can't take any credit for it, but it was all her. So it was in-house and she didn't have any video editing skills heading into this, this COVID time. Um, but she learned it along the way just through, yeah, YouTube and trial and error. So it's been really impressive awesome. to see. Thanks so much. Um, we, I'm gonna put all of our speakers on, um, just profile them right now. And uh, we haven't actually had any questions have come in except one last one. Um, so we'll touch on that as well as, uh, I just have a question for everybody, first of all, Thank you so much. It's really neat seeing all the differences and how you're trying to make it work and uh, just a lot of creativity and I'm sure it's been so much effort. So congratulations um, and really neat to just see uh, see that during our time today. So I'm wondering um, what has been, Elle has touched on it a little bit, but what have you heard from teachers, from students, from others? What has worked? Like what have you found has gotten really good reception and what um, you know didn't really pan out like you expected? You can just speak to that. Whoever wants to go can can touch on that. Okay, I'll go. Okay, go, Sandy. Go ahead, Sandy. Go ahead. Okay. I, I can't think of any downsides. Like, you know, everything that we throw out there has been taken up. And, um, you know, I'm just in awe of teachers right now who have the burden of the world on their shoulders. And if we can lighten that load and make, you know, make their day easier, then it's all good. And like, there's nothing that hasn't been well received, basically. I mean, maybe, maybe more teachers would take up the materials if they weren't stressed by, by factors outside of their control. Um, yeah, I, I, I would like to second that Sunday because uh, the fact that teachers, that, that parents in our Oasis Box program who were teachers reached out and said, I want to use this material in my online classrooms blew my mind because I was like, with all the stress that's already on their shoulders to, to make it work, um, it's, it's really interesting to see them. And in our, uh, like we have a club uh, for teachers for school gardens uh, that we created uh, way before COVID. And uh, even though we haven't been contributing to that club, uh, nobody has been canceling. They're all there and they're all, uh, we, we see them actually logging in and using the material that we put, put together before. Um, and, and which is really not much for uh, teaching online. And but we could see that as soon as the schools actually started, they started coming in and logging in again and, and using the material. Uh, that means that even though there, there's so much on their shoulders, they're still thinking about incorporating um, this type of thing into their teaching, which is really admirable. 
I think one thing I can add to that is just that I think it's the teachers we're focusing on right now, the teachers we've always worked with and have always been passionate about bringing this content into their classes. And we're just focused on trying to make it as easy for them to access as possible. Um, and really just, just focusing on who you serve. I think it's easy in this day and age to get lost and like, it's for everyone. <laughs> um, but you know, if it's for everyone, it's for no one. Um, and so honing in on who, who are you serving and, and what are their needs? And I know we've had to kind of cut back. We used to do high, high school to kindergarten, and now we're just focusing on sort of uh, grades like three to eight. So focusing in, I think is also helpful, but in addition to what these folks have said. Andrew, any last, uh, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I was just, I was just going to add that um, the things that have worked best quite often are the, are the simplest things. And, and there's a, I think everybody's nodding. I think we, we've all felt our own pressure to like want to go bigger or fancier or more elaborate. And um, it's amazing what resonates with people the most seems to just be um, we all carry, and, and likely almost everyone on this call as well, has some expertise in the in the areas that we offer. And that's what's of value and what people are looking for, as opposed to fancy production value or, um, I mean, it's nice when you can add it in, but but that's the thing. I've also found uh, for us, we've, we've heard from a lot of teachers and um, the things that we've heard from teachers the most are how to talk about food in the classroom and have food related activities without actually using food and tasting in the classroom because it it brings in this whole other host of risk and and things um and i've been thrilled and very surprised with how many parents are willing to take an extension or follow-up activity and actually do it with their children at home um, once that's started in the classroom so that's been that's been a really big bonus if i may add uh Okay, go ahead, Sandy. <laughs> this happens. Go ahead. <laughs> I, yeah, parents are hungry for 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 um, material, especially those who are who have their kids at home, and they're not going physically to school. They're hungry for experiential experiential learning material, and that I think that's. Even though we've been really focusing online for parents up until the the, the box, um, uh, the box is taking off because parents are like, I want something that physically comes to me that has the seeds in there, that has the, you know, the the activity guide in there, and my kids can follow and actually grow something, which brings hope to the house. That's one thing, all gardens do, but right now they really are are are. Uh, hungry for something that takes the kids off the screens um, so that they can have an experience that that's hands-on and authentic. I was just going to add that um, we, before COVID, we had a partnership going with public health nurses and because of COVID that stopped obviously. So that's another kind of downside that I had missed in my presentation. Um, it's, it's actually a, a, a really sweet connection to have um, public health involved in our programming and we certainly look forward to, uh, to them being able to be redeployed back to schools for nutrition and, you know, where, whatever they're doing now, contact tracing or whatever. So it's definitely um, a, a loss that we feel. Carolyn, I noticed a, a question just about how to deal with uh, workshops and kits with distance learning kids. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I just wanted to share in our in our experience, um, delivering kits, we've been delivering kits directly to people's houses, both uh, ourselves and, and with through partners. Um, and, and even through some of the Ontario uh, Student Nutrition Program partnerships where, where families were getting full meals delivered to their homes, we found an incredible, uh, this is a really key way to continue having volunteers being involved in um, programming when it's not really safe to bring them in the building and have them interacting with our staff or, or with clients. Um, we found that volunteers in, in so many organizations we've been partnering with are happy to come uh, pick up the kits and, and kind of Uber driver ask them to everybody's homes. Um, it's helped us keep that connection with our volunteers and, and, and help them feel involved in helping out. So, um, yeah. 
Thanks for jumping to that next question, Andrew, and uh, addressing it. We can have everybody touch on it. And then there's a question about um, sustainability and funding that I'd like to ask. But um, yeah, do other the th other three of you, Sunday, El, or Leila, want to touch on? Um, are you doing you know workshops or kits with distance learning, remote learning families? Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, we just, we can um, offer them for pickup for the local schools. So uh, that, that works out pretty well. Um, but also we are delivering. And then for the online students, the teacher has to be willing to do those deliveries because we're not privy to the addresses. So it's, it, it does add a, a burden on them. Yeah, so with, with our boxes, essentially, we've been shipping, and shipping is a huge cost, actually. Um, because we are not a non-for-profit non organization, and we don't rely, we can't rely on volunteer work, um, it has to it has to be, so. And, and that makes our boxes more expensive for parents uh, as well. So if there's any organization who likes the idea and would like to sponsor parents, um, to to make this happen for them that would be that would be like we have a five dollar uh, uh flat rate shipping that we include in our uh cost which no it's nowhere near the cost of shipping uh especially the, inside canada so we have families from the united states that are in this program uh we ship to them for seven dollars seven eight dollars uh and uh we we can't ship in, within Canada uh, for less than $15. Uh, like in Ontario, some places is seven, eight dollars. But if I'm shipping something to a little bit uh, further than Ontario, the costs are really high uh, and it's a, it's a huge burden. Um, and, and the families look at our, pro, uh, our uh, the cost of our boxes and they're like, whoa, this is way too high. They think we're greedy. <laughs> but when you look into all of the things that we have to do to make it happen, like all the like if I show you, like this is an example of one of our boxes. There's this educational material that goes into it. There's printing that happens, like for the activity guide, um, that so that the kids can actually have something in their hand to follow. And there's the seeds that we actually include in the box. And so cost of that is one thing, and like all of this and the box and everything. And the cost of shipping is a whole different. Uh, thing, especially within Canada, it really breaks my heart that I have to, that I can't reach out to more Canadian uh, families because of the cost of shipping, uh, because it at least takes twice the amount of shipping that I, that I can ship much easier to, to the US, but uh, there's a lot of difficulties. And I think that's essentially monopoly that, that um, Canada Post has. Uh, so there's no competition between the, the shipping companies that they, that, uh, within Canada, which is anyway, yeah, yeah, it is what it is, but yeah. it's really prohibiting. Uh, so I, I welcome any, uh, sponsorship and partnerships that, that could come through. Uh, thanks Layla. Yeah. And thanks for sharing the realistic challenges. It's important for everybody to know that as well. Um, Elle, do you have any comments about remote learners? Um, we haven't worked with any remote classes. We have worked with um, some after school programs. And so with those, what we're doing is again, we're focusing pretty hyper local on our kits. So um, with those, what we're doing is we're having pickup slots. So we're a food bank, we are delivering, we utilize volunteers similar to what uh, Andrew was suggesting, which is they love having something to do. Um, <laughs> and we're lucky to have so many great volunteers. But uh, pick up time. So we'll just say like, okay, you can come by this time to this time. We have a doorbell out front. When you ring it, somebody will come up and bring you a kit. So um, we're still figuring those things out. But uh, yeah, I, I'm with you, Layla. Like, I don't want to get into shipping. Like, it's, it's a slippery slope. So yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Um, we're just about at time. But I was just wondering, we have a question about um, how are you um, funding your program and, and continuing to make it work? Can you just share a few words, each of you, to just give a picture of how that's working? The question is for, for everyone. 
Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll go first. We are not a non-for-profit organization. Uh, our funding comes from the revenue that uh, that that is brought to us. Um, so we our programs comes with a cost. Uh, the school usually pays for our programs, and the school goes out and uh, gets funding. Uh, the funding sometimes comes from um, non-profit organizations, sometimes comes from funders, places like uh, TD or Royal Bank and places like that. Uh, Evergreen Brickworks, for example, has, has, a, has a funding program, and, and there's, there's a few staples has one. So the teachers essentially in schools go out and uh, find the funding. And a lot of our YRDSB schools fund our programs through the parent council. So they do fundraising uh, like a pizza day or cookie day and things like that. Uh, and we've had schools that uh, actually divided the, the cost of the program between uh, different things. So they had a little bit of funding that came through uh, the the some came from the parent council some came, came from the uh, principal's budget because our program actually connects with Ontario curriculum very well and that's why it's an in-school program so the principal sometimes uh, put some other budgets towards it and we've even had uh, situations that a little bit of money came from the the students the parents the, the families who we taught like for those classrooms that we taught um, and it, it is definitely a challenge uh, and anything else that we provide like our online programs uh, for teachers the teachers have to pay for it uh, and they have to go out and find uh, what the funding uh, where the funding comes from it's unfortunate but we're uh, we're not a non-for-profit and we our expertise is not like this is not uh, something that we're very good at. Uh, uh, so again, open for collaborations. If there's anybody who likes uh, what we do and would like to sponsor the teachers or the schools, uh, that would be that would be amazing. Thanks, Lila. Anyone else? Just a few words about funding. Yeah, ours is a mix of government. Um, grants uh, we we have some beautiful funding through NSERC the promo science program um, and city of toronto for the trees um, uh, a lot of individual and you know usually fundraising so we're trying to make up that gap um, and um, yeah it's it's a work in progress we probably won't break even this year um, but yeah, it's wage subsidies, the Canada summer jobs, uh, all very critical for our work. Thanks, Andy. I can go really quick. Um, yes, we're super lucky as well that we just happened to uh, receive some grant funding for our expansion right, right when this happened. So I can't, I can't downplay how fortunate we were to be in that position. Um, that said, uh, Growing Chefs generally speaking, generates about 60 to 65 percent of our own revenue through operating an event space and a lunch program that were both shut down. Uh, and we've been able to supplement a bunch of that income by partnering with other not-for-profits and community groups in the city. Um, as every not-for-profit in the community is trying to adjust their fundraising efforts to a virtual platform, we've been able to uh, offer a uh, value add to those virtual events by dedicating a day of our space and our chef team to making meals that people can pick up from our space and then enjoy together on the virtual uh, platform. Um, so we can customize those menus, we can price them on a sliding scale to best meet the needs of the different organizations. We've done um, for a local group called Child Reach and Big, Big Brothers Big Sisters London, we, uh, for those two events, we offered over 300 meal packages out to a company with our virtual events down to we did a partnership with our local orchestra last weekend that had 60 uh, meals purchased on top of the ticket to the virtual event. Um, and when you put that together, we've been able to, to uh, bring in just over $45,000 in food service contracts since uh, July 1st, the beginning of our fiscal year. So that's helped us supplement some of those event spaces and, and just kind of, I, I hope showcases the, the 
uh, ingenuity and, and flexibility of the nonprofit sector to kind of always be looking for solutions. Also, if anyone's uh, struggling, I just wanted to offer, I know Pillar Innovation Works, which is our Pillar not-for-profit group here in London, is offering um, very inexpensive workshops for nonprofits who haven't been taking advantage of like the wage subsidies and government support programs over the past couple of months. Um, I believe it's just pillar.ca or pillarnonprofit.ca. I'll look that link up and share it with you, Carolyn. But uh, if anyone hasn't tapped into those resources, you can apply in hindsight um, and even go back and I'll start applying back from April uh, moving forward. And I recommend doing that or looking into it if you haven't already, because it's a huge help and we wouldn't be on the right side of things with it, without it. Thanks for sharing, Andrew. Yeah, I can quickly just jump in and say that, you know, Parkdale Food Center is much larger than just this program, which is Growing Futures. And um, we are a food bank, so um, it's it's been a really strange time. <laughs> but uh, basically, we've been, our staff has been reallocated. So for a good portion of the beginning of the COVID, we were reassigned to food bank. And so that helped to alleviate the cost of our program to keep all of our staff on initially. Um, and through the generosity of donors and that kind of thing. So we really just shifted back uh, since the end of the summer into our program roles. And um, we are just retooling the, the, the program grants that we had before. And then we've had, we've applied for some just like program adaptation grants too. So um, really a little unsure about how we're gonna be moving forward. But like I said, we, we do charge a fee for service for our workshops. It's pretty accessible for most schools. Um, and we, we hope to keep that way, um, but we're working with uh, various partners and who knows my, what might come out of that, the Ottawa School Food Network. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we're kind of optimistic and waiting and trying to do a lot of evaluation with what we're doing already so that we can use that to really strengthen our future grant applications. But it's a mix for us, so it's a mix. All right. Well, thank you so much. That's all the time we have for questions. but. Um, yeah, really appreciate everything that you've shared today. Um, and thanks to everybody for all the questions that you have uh, posed. So I'm going to turn off the record function now. All right, great that we're all back now. Um, we have a very small amount of time, but in about a minute or so, I'm just wondering if each of the four of you could touch on just a few key themes that came up. Yeah, I'm happy to go first. Um, we had a great little discussion, five of us, and. Um, there was a, a few people in our group who were just just learning. They really haven't figured out what their adaptation will look like, and they're trying to take inventory of you know what opportunities they have that are unique to them. So one person mentioned that um, they were in a rural location and that there's an opportunity to do a lot of outdoor stuff. So I'm trying to figure out how to use that and um, talked a little bit about challenges um, that kind of are coming up. So just the 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 grappling on to the content. Um, one, one person was working with high school students um, and just saying that that was a little bit difficult and they were working across provinces. So the regulations were very different. And then, um, you know, we talked about uh, effective reporting and funding as being key issues. And um, I just was highlighting that like developing new skills has been a real challenge in this time as a person running the program, so. Thanks that was about all we chatted about. Um, any other of you? 30 seconds to a minute, um, just a quick report back. Sunday? I want to give my time over to Mo because she was just mid-sentence when we got cut off and I think it, she really brought it together for us. Although there's a lot of diversity among our group in terms of what people are rolling out and and the outdoor piece and the or the 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 culinary piece, it's all all over the map and wonderful to hear about. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Do you want to speak, Mo? I'll just say the sentence I was sort of looking at was, um, it seems like this Edible Education Network has a really important uh, continued role in terms of us working on some of the particulars like bringing back um, public health into our roles because across all of our regions, there's been um, reassignment and a loss of that connection. Um, tackling some of the evaluation elements, um, advocating for the need of this kind of education as essential, not um, additional. Uh, some really great work in Thunder Bay around outdoor education and not like advocating to ensure that it is not just online that we're doing, that we are prioritizing together the need to be in the classrooms and finding ways to keep that safe, which could be outdoor classrooms and things like that. But trying to find some, of, some additional ways that we can uh, tackle some of these particulars as we go forward. 
so much, Mo. Yeah, I've taken note of those, and those could be future calls and opportunities. So much appreciated. Thanks, Layla or Andrew. Uh, yeah, so uh, in our group, we uh, had a few different things that we talked about. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we all agreed that if, if this would become part of the curriculum, that would be very helpful. Uh, but also, which is the Bill 216, and um, I don't know how what uh, conversations was uh, were going on in the main room, uh, would, would be interested to know about that too. Uh, but um, yeah, because it, it would facilitate uh, a lot, and it will open a lot of doors. Uh, one of the main issues that we have is that this is not part of the curriculum, so it's not mandated for a lot of people. Everybody, as, as, as was mentioned just now, everybody's trying to do it as an extra, as an add-on, and, and we, we're trying to actually connect it to the curriculum because it does connect, but if it becomes an item, then the curriculum is, is, is very helpful. Another thing that came up was um, uh, one person was talking about how she's trying to... Uh, again adjust and see how she can bring food literacy both the the growing of it and the preparing of food uh, and uh, she was excited about uh, the the online portion of it especially uh, like she was thinking probably the what what l uh, uh, in, introduced the pre-recorded uh, videos would, would be would would seem to be a lot easier for the teacher because it provides flexibility um, and yeah, so I think that that sums it up. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, I just wanna say thanks to the people in my chat. We had people from uh, uh, outside of Ontario and kind of all across the country. Um, and just had some, some good chats about being at different stages of things. And just wanted to uh, say what came out of it is, I, I think the, the importance of, of working together and learning from each other and, and doing our best to uh, adapt as we can and um, to everybody on the call. Good luck surviving over the next little bit. Uh, hopefully we're, uh, when, when all of this passes, we'll be in better shape because of all of this as we try and forward food literacy together as a network. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to just uh, then show I haven't figured out for some reason. Oh, no, that, uh, no, sorry. I'm trying to figure out how to screen share and not hide everything else in my screen and it's not working out. So I'm just going to show, um, it's not working. So thank you um, to everyone so much for summing that up. Thank you for, um, the speakers who have really helped brainstorm how this might be a great session for breakout groups and everything like that. We had a lot of back and forth about how to make it work. Um, but I think I'll just take this moment to, um, yeah, to just reiterate those thank yous to all of you for showing up, to coming here, to um, sharing your ideas or just the challenges that you're experiencing. It has been quite the difficult time. Um, we are, as the Edible Education Network, hoping to have uh, many more events like this. It seems to be a time where people really want to connect and hear from each other. So um, please reach out if you would like to present on how your model is adapting, how your program is um, changing in these times. Um, my email is right there. Uh, or um, please also fill out the uh, survey that I'll be sending out afterwards, where we'll be asking, you know, what would you like future conversations to focus on? We will be trying to have more of these conversations where people can break out and um, check in with each other and connect and uh, share ideas. And so again, just wanna hear from you and what would be most useful. Uh, with that, a big thanks to everybody uh, for being here, making it happen, again, for sharing. And uh, with that, um, your room is still open. If you'd like to go back and continue, um, feel free, although I know all of you have places to go. So thanks again for joining and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.